we call, if you will, that we've been making power safe 100s. I've been kind of surprised at the reception of this. We uh, everybody wants one. The solar guys are a little different yeah. than the EV guys. Uh, we did this as a demonstration that with our controller you could do a big battery. Now we call it a power safe 100. That's a nice round figure. That's actually 20 Tesla Model S modules that are about 5.5 kilowatts each. It's really about a 120 kilowatt battery. These things get to be kind of squishy to talk about to make the batteries last longer. We'll charge them to 4 or 4.05 volts instead of the full 20. Yep. Uh, 4.2, uh, and we, we kind of cut them off about 3.2 volts or 3.25. So we're not really using the whole battery in the interest of safety and long life. We uh, did this to demonstrate for you how to assemble parts, and every part in the PowerSafe 100 is also in our web store, except for like Unistruts and some bolts, Steel anglers. you know, little common yeah. hardware items, everything you need to do that in any size you want is there, um, primarily to enable you to do the same <laughs> thing. Um, our first guy who started this was Walter Crumbly in Costa Rica. Walter has a house and a bar and a restaurant, some little cabins, and gets about 30 power interruptions a month. <laughs> Costa Rica is supposedly all renewable <laughs> energy. The good side of that is there's no fossil fuels. Yeah. The bad side is there's it's no energy. energy. <laughs> Their electrical service is Unstable. abysmal. So uh, we shipped that actually several months ago, and Walter was in a big rush to get yeah. it. <laughs> and I didn't get into a big rush delivering it. He's building a house. And I kind of knew these things take time, but I didn't know how much time. <laughs> we shipped it to Tampa. In phase, kind of had a shortage of their IQ7Xs. Burns. And so even after he got the power safe, he couldn't ship it to Costa Rica because he was waiting for his Panasonic panels mm. and the Enphase IQ7s. <laughs> we were a little too fast. <laughs> Interesting thing. Two years ago, I kind of made a mess of things by appropriating the term AC coupling. AC coupling has been around for years using grid-tied inverters to supply the grid. I kind of tongue-in-cheek use the term AC coupling to talk about grid-tied inverters in through our off-grid inverter to charge batteries because you talked about DC panels charging the batteries for a battery system as DC coupling. What a mess. <laughs> At now, two years later, I'm, I'm pleased and bemused to amount, announce that everybody has <laughs> gone with my turn. And everybody has this stuff now. Uh, back in phase has announced and produced their ensemble where they use eight grid-tied inverters in a device to transfer energy from their... Um, rooftop inverters to a battery. <laughs> and we've uh, tried to get them to provide us with the communications protocol. They have demurred because uh, they want to sell the battery themselves. A two, a one kilowatt hour <laughs> battery for 2000 freaking dollars. <laughs> that would make a power safe worth 200,000 bucks. <laughs> You're welcome, Walter. I didn't know it was such a bargain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> God. 
So he got his panels and his in-phase inverters, put them all in a container, shipped them to Costa Rica, and only had to pay $27,000 of customs duty customs. to Costa Rica, who is trying to be all sustainable energy Renewable, yeah. for a power safe 100 and a bunch of solar panels. The greed wow. is just palpable. You can feel it. And there's nothing like being a government for being able to simply grab and grasp and take and steal whatever you like. And it's just stealing. It's not a tax. It's just theft. Theft with a gun. It's like living in feudal times. <laughs> if the knights come through on their horses, you give them whatever they want. Yep. Or you die. Nothing's changed. But, not to be dark. Uh, <laughs> On a lighter note. Walter got his stuff landed this week. Nice. Do you recall me describing how they were going to get up the mountain, um, James? Um, I think you said it was going to take a lot of people carrying it on their backs or something? Or? No, I said Truck? 27. 27. Aborigine. Come back me to me. Nuns. That, yep, that sticks out. Yep. On a goat cart, go, go. pushing it up a mountain. A goat cart or a go cart? Goat cart. Goats, okay. Animal, nice. You're going to put the Power Save 100 on a goat cart, 27, three foot tall nuns. We're going to push it up the hill. Man, I didn't miss by much. <laughs> by the way, that was a joke. <laughs> Walter sent us a photograph. They installed wheels on the back edge of the container. Wow. And drug it up this mountain around these switchback corners and stuff to his location at the top of the hill. And it is now securely mounted, still in the container, <laughs> on the top of the mountain where his house is going to be. And he's got a big old forklift parked right next to it. And has plans of opening the container. Ooh. So it's coming along. That's big, it's coming yeah. along. <laughs> step by step. Our, wow. No sooner did we get our, actually the same week we shipped our Power Safe 100 demonstration. Uh, well, I guess the demonstration was our prototype. Unit. Yeah. Our first one for somebody was Walter. The week we shipped that, uh, Wayne Revere's called from uh, Tuxedo Park, New York. He has an island in Antigua called Little Hog K, and he wanted one. Beautiful island. And it took us a good six weeks to build that one. Um, and uh, all packaged up. Mostly Danu and James do the building of these things. I'm like very good about drinking Dr. Pepper. <laughs> and offering my advice on everything they're doing wrong. <laughs> Which, fortunately, they broadly ignore and do it, do it anyway, and that's how we get one. That's how we get one. <laughs> we shipped that one last week to Wayne Revere's in uh, Chester, New York, where his farm is. And he sent us some little videos. I'll put a couple of clips. Uh, and this looks like three monkeys trying to fuck a football to move this thing. They got it out of the crate somehow, yeah. which scares me to death. That's a test. It's his now. I guess <laughs> if he breaks it, he owns both halves. It melts. And they forklifted it into a container. But he's going to set this all up as some containerized power plant um, and test it all at his farm in Chester. Um, and then he's going to, I guess, I don't know, helicopter the thing or something to yeah. uh, Antigua once it's working to his satisfaction here. And uh, so he's uh, pretty thrilled uh, to receive it. Neither have actually turned on the ON slash OFF switch in anger. 
Yeah, so still I'm nervous. still yeah. <laughs> kind of on pins and needles. Ours is working quite well here in the shop, but we're constantly messing with it. Uh, so the idea comes up. The guys like putting these together so well. <laughs> they want to <laughs> <They wanna, laughs> do another one. Yeah. Isn't that a hoot? Uh, what do you got here, James? Well, we got a smaller Wigman here. Uh, I believe this one is 60 by 36 and 17 inches tall here. Uh -huh. um, it didn't come, with the, come to us with wheels on it, so we had to put wheels through the little eyelets here. Not eyelets, the little tabs here. Um, we're working it has on. little tabs to mount it on the wall. Yeah. But, um, boy, that's kind of awkward. So we think while we're building it, we'll put wheels on it so we can move it around and stuff. And uh, it also gives, now that I see it, I don't know why anybody would mount it on the wall. Yep. This is the way to deal with this thing. Yep. It and rolls uh, nice. It, it, unlike the Power Safe 100, <laughs> Walter, Wayne, this one won't fall over and kill you. <laughs> it might fall over, but yeah. it's not going to kill you. <laughs> yeah, so we put wheels on it, and then... Uh, that power safe weighed what? The last one we shipped? Just the power safe weighed... I think it was... Was it 2,037 2, pounds? Something like that. If that falls on you... You're a flat cat, just like a kitty cat on the freeway. <laughs> so this one's going to be more horizontal. Yep. You said 60, 36, 17. We really got, what, 16 Six, inside? Yeah, the lid adds an extra inch on Pull it. Pull her open and let's have a look. All right. Make sure all your locks are good. Oh, that's pretty cunning. Yeah. He's got gas struts uh, on the lid, uh, so you don't have to hold it open in one hand, work with the other. Nope, don't think concussion. You're thinking you're going to use both hands sometimes when you're putting it together. Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> so what are you going to do with this? So we're going to put 12 batteries in an inverter, 12 kilowatt inverter. Uh huh. Um, make that a 60 kilowatt power safe. Um, yeah, we're hoping to. Get all that in there, make sure it looks nice. We're going to use a, kind of a similar display as a power safe with our e stop, our Raspberry Pi, the inverter display, mm -hmm. uh, LEDs for the contactors. And then we have the new uh, switches, circuit breaker switches, that we're going to mount on the sides. Huh. This is. Uh... Well, it's actually a three pole. 150 amp, I think, uh, circuit breaker, but it's got this little actuator that if you turn it, it flips the switch up and down. And it's got this neat handle on it. Um, we uh, saw this on the Sandy 15 kilowatt explosion proof. Mm -hmm. And so we asked them about it, and they were kind of secretive and so forth. Well, I finally talked them into just selling us some, but they they wanted me to buy a hundred of them. Whew. So we've got them in the web store. <laughs> I'm sure we'll sell seven. Yeah. What we're going to do with the other 93, I don't know. But let's use a couple of them on this because yep. it makes a really nice on off switch to cut off your box output or turn on the box input if you want to hook it up to the grid um, and I I just like them they're heavy uh, they do three wires and uh, you know, just a cool switch I like cool switches and lights and <laughs> buttons and stuff like Gizmos. that. I never met a connector I like, but I've never met a switch or a button I didn't like. <laughs> <laughs> I want all it works, of Yeah. <laughs> so you think you can get 12 yeah. batteries in here? Yeah. At Model S modules? Model S modules, yes sir. Well that would be 66 kilowatts, I guess. 
um, we'll call it a 60. And I have had a number of inquiries from people, most recently a guy that's retiring from the telephone company down here to Arkansas and wants to uh, build entirely off-grid. And he doesn't think he wants a power safe 100, but a 40 or 50 kilowatt. Okay, you can manage. This will be just out of his reach yeah. at 60. Not to keep him interested. <laughs> not to keep him interested, but not enough where we got a ship in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, so that'll be our next project. Let's go with a 15 kilowatt okay. inverter instead of a 12. Oh because I just got a shipment of 15 coming in this week. And Danu kind of figured out how to wire the 12s yep. uh, to have the 60 to 62 and a half hertz frequency switch uh, for the 12 kilowatts. We're the only ones in the world that have that. Signeer actually made me some new control boards nice. to uh, do that like the 15 kilowatts does. So we've had to take all of our stock at 12, swap out the control board, and wire to the dip switch um, so that you can have an input. We put a little connector instead of the two little pin. dry contacts. We put like a two pin connector on it you hook up to. Found some very interesting things. Um, man, those wires. <laughs> from the dip switch go to the control board and apparently right in the middle of like a 3.3 .3 volt circuit. So any noise on those wires oh. will drive this thing crazy and it puts transients out on our grid tied inverters and causes them to trip off sort of at random. And the solution we found after months was to uh, use uh, twisted pair shielded wire on these connections um, for the phase shift. So we were kind of out of the 15 kilowatts and <laughs> we figured out how to get the, the frequency shift on uh, the 12s and now we're down to one or two of those left. Two. And so uh, Probably better use the 15. They're the same size physically, really. Yeah. Um, All right. So we'll put a 15 kilowatt in here and uh, 12 of those batteries. And with all the switches and dials and BMS stuff, I think you're going to pack this box pretty full. Yeah. We may wind up with 10 um, modules for 50K. Yeah. Um, but if you get 12 in there, it's kind of how many potatoes can you put in a 10-pound sack? Well, it might be 10 pounds. You might get lucky. Get 12 pounds in a 10-pound yeah. sack. Um, so I think it's going to be pretty tight. But I like what you go on, have going on with the wheels and the gas struts. Richard Flingy uh, kind of invented the flat top topper for pickup trucks back in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And so he knows all about these gas struts. I said, man, we'd like to put some gas struts so we don't have to hold the lid open, Richard. Yep. And the, bada boom, bada bing. Next day, he had them here <laughs> and uh, and had put them on, knows how to do the geometry and stuff yep. for that, uh, which always drives me crazy. Yeah. And we've got nice gas struts. When you lift it open, it's open. It closes. You close it, it's closed. Yep. So let's, uh, right now the box itself is empty. But uh, we will have this panel covered with our displays, buttons, switches, <laughs> switches, Red and uh, yep. so forth. Um, we haven't really decided whether it ought to <laughs> run yes. this way or this okay. way. Yeah. But uh, I see them actually using this on the floor, leaving the wheels on, and, uh, and yeah. going from there. Um, I like the configuration. Um, and with the wheels, uh, you guys can put it on the forklift, raise it up to waist level to work on it. 
Yeah. And you'll be fancy. Down. <laughs> yeah, we'll be fancy. This will be easier to reach than anything you've ever done. Oh, yeah. Tight spaces in the power safe. Lean in all the way in. So this introducing the power safe 60. And we're going to try to uh, film um, all of the interesting steps anyway mm -hmm. in uh, putting that together. They're going to come up with uh, the neatest design for securely mounting these modules in a box that I've ever seen. Now, I've never seen it. <laughs> uh, and I have no idea what they're going to come up with, but I'm sure I'm going to be amazed. Yep. Awestruck. Knock your crocs off. Yes. <laughs> and so that's going to be kind of cool, because if somebody did pick it up and hang it on the wall, it's we'd be like fun. for all the batteries not to fall out <laughs> in their lap. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, they're not to shift, you. Yep. And they're going to be laying down on the back side. So that's uh, an issue. So the Power Safe saga continues. Um, and we're uh, selling a lot of the V2 controllers now, battery modules, and uh, uh, and, and the Signature inverters. And uh, the nice thing about that, I'm sympathetic in doing these bigger projects. It's kind of a demonstration. But I'm sympathetic. Most people uh, don't know me <laughs> from Adams Off Fox. <laughs> and uh, this is kind of new territory uh, anyway, and I'm sympathetic to that. So what they're wanting to do is take two modules for a little 10 kilowatt hour. Um, lithium-ion battery pack mm -hmm. and our controller and a signature inverter and wired up and it's uh, we're kind of set up for that the way our uh, wiring harnesses are you can kind of collect and trade them with your friends <laughs> and uh, you can do up to 62 modules which is 341 kilowatt hours uh, if you don't mind seeing all that on the screen <laughs> in the configuration um, and so uh, you can start small and uh, work your way up uh, pretty easily. There's also something going on with the batteries. Yeah. And I kind of predicted this. What I'm fascinated with is how everybody is maintaining the price officially, but they would let you have the batteries for nice. about thousand bucks a pop yeah. uh, and so uh, we're I think what we're seeing is a slow motion bursting of the bubble <laughs> in the business of buying uh, full packs taking the modules out of them and making a killing off of two hours work <laughs> I still think it'll be a profitable business but you're going to have to get used to the idea of just working for 50 or 100 bucks an hour yeah. instead of uh, making six or seven thousand dollars for an afternoon's labor. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what's been going on. I don't know what that's about, but I would say that we've kind of reached uh, saturation um, on the number of people currently experimenting with solar and the availability of batteries has kind of uh, washed out. Mm -hmm. uh, it will eventually reach some equilibrium and some steady state price, and I have no idea what that will be. Interesting. Um, but anyway, it kind of supports the thesis of picking up a couple, wiring this thing up, playing with it, and seeing what you can do. Definitely. And then it will become apparent that however much battery you have, that's not quite enough. <laughs> Just a little bit bigger would probably come. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and uh, and that will continue to whatever size you get to be. Yep. <laughs> Keep adding. <laughs> there is uh, an unending um, need for uh, energy storage. And so we're, we're kind of having our salad days here. We almost can't spend time on these projects, much less... The Model 3 that I'm intent on working on um, for uh, simply the production of uh, units uh, for people kind of coming on board for that. 
So we're uh, sort of stepping and fetching to uh, keep all our business in order and maintain the... We usually ship the same day or the next day of when we get an order, except for a power safe. Thing, yeah. so. <laughs> and we kind of work on those when we can while uh, supporting the smaller uh, orders. So this is going to be our next big project, a little bit smaller than the PowerSafe 100. We could have either gone up to the PowerSafe 200 or gone down, but I think there's probably, I hear from a lot of people that think they don't need 100 kilowatt hours. So we're going to sell them a 50 or 60 kilowatt hour unit and then sell them the other 50 or 60 kilowatt hour unit later. There you go. <laughs> You know, yeah. <laughs> it's uh, ever so, Felt, not yeah. ever so much so, but ever so nonetheless. nonetheless. Um, so that's our intro to Power Safe sixty. Um, I think I want to talk. Oh, I actually don't want to, but I think I should talk about something you all are intensely not interested in. But we're going to talk about it anyway. And that is surge protection. I've got some reasons as to why. I'm not going to say they're good reasons. <laughs> but we're going to talk about it and get it the hell out of our way. Uh -huh. uh, it is kind of necessary for you to understand what's going on. People are selling you all some stuff that... Um, well, they're doing a lot of selling, <laughs> and and you need to buy some. You know but what there's buying. a big, um, great gaping gap um, in basic knowledge of metal oxide resistors and surge suppression down to what a surge is, and and that sort of thing that we need to take a look at. So we're going to start filming that. I don't know if it'll ever end, but. Uh, <laughs> But let's, uh, let's take a look at that. Stay with us. Nice box, James. <laughs> Our foray into uh, solar energy battery storage over the last two years has kind of brought us immediately into the topic of surge protection. We've been re recommending this midnight solar surge protection device uh, they've just changed it completely and it's caused me to take a look at uh, surge protection devices uh, overall <clears throat> when we say surge protection people get the idea that we're talking about a change in voltage like a ocean surge coming in to the beach um, it's not, it has this very specific term, um, and it, it is for transient voltage and current spikes of extremely brief duration. Um, but they can be terribly damaging, uh, even though they are brief. Um, that said, your electronic equipment is, uh, somewhat better protected than they would have you believe. Worse, um, a sur brief survey of the YouTube explanations of surge protection is actually comical. Uh, but when you dig a little deeper, you find that the manufacturers are of no help at all. They uh, each have specification sheets that are completely different from one another and very difficult to compare. And they rarely match the specifications uh, stated by the components they use, which is overwhelmingly a metal oxide varistor. Um, let's talk about the sources in nature of these transient voltage spikes. Uh, of course, the overwhelming number of them come from lightning, but they can come from other sources as well. Your uh, inductive devices on your premises, like your air conditioning compressor, 
Um, if you recall our air compressor, uh, we had a big uh, power spike when we first turned it on. Not seen was a uh, accompanying uh, huge voltage spike that it puts on the whole um, system in the building, both when it starts and more uh, importantly and uh, somewhat larger usually when it stops. This also happens with your air conditioner, compressor, or any inductive motor to a greater or lesser degree. Um, you might notice that when you have a power outage, you often lose equipment. Uh, out on the pole next to your house is a uh, transformer with a 5600 volt primary and usually a 240 volt secondary with a center tap, which is where you get your neutral L1 and L2 phases. Um, if you lose power, uh, that uh, normally induces a transient across that transformer, a pretty significant one actually, into your system. <clears throat> when they turn the power back on, you get a second one. And so a lot of people lose surge protectors or their TVs and computers from power outages. Even if you turn on and off your master switch into your system, that causes voltage transients. Certainly if you have a short circuit and one of your circuit breakers blows, that'll put a pretty significant voltage transient on your system. But just turning circuits on and off with your circuit breakers, which we do all the time around here, puts uh, pretty significant transients on the uh, line. These can be uh, 10 to 20,000 volts in amplitude. Uh, fortunately, a mercifully brief duration. Your equipment in your house is actually um, quite protected, especially the more expensive things like televisions and computers. Uh, would you believe they can typically take a 1500 volt or even a 2000 volt surge? In fact, when you think about it, their design is such that they work on electrical systems that across the country, some are 208 volt systems, some are 220 volt systems, uh, some are 240 volt systems. Ours measures 250 now most of the time. Um, and so th they're already dealing with varying voltages and uh, noise is a lot more routine than you think. The reason you're blissfully unaware of most of it is that they do survive it and these transient spikes are so small you can't really see them. Uh, let's talk about how small they are. UL1449 was uh, introduced in 1996 by 1986 by the National Fire Protection Association, actually, before it was a UL. And it was because there was a lot of introductions of uh, surge suppressors um, in the late 80s, and they had a propensity to burn down houses. The failure mode of a metal oxide varistor is to short, and they were kind of unprotected then when they would give up the ghost uh, they would often short and burn up, uh, sometimes to such a degree that they melted the plastic and set the carpet on fire. So UL1449 is now up to edition four of 2015. One of the things they do is mandate testing of these devices, and they use some model waveforms uh, for current and for voltage. Um, to test them with um, that are kind of mathematical models of like, likely lightning pulses. Now, as you may have observed, a lightning pulse can be a quick flash or a longer one. So there's not really, um, you know, a precise definition of this, but they have developed standard models. One of them most of the Chinese manufacturers use is a 10 microsecond by 1,000 microsecond um, waveform. Now, what we mean by that is that it goes from zero to a peak uh, voltage 
in 10 microseconds. And then it decays to a 50% value of the peak in 1,000 microseconds. Here in the U.S., uh, UL 1449, it, they more commonly use an 8 by 20 current waveform. That is 8 microseconds to peak and 20 microseconds to 50% um, of its value. Now understand those are current waveforms. They also have models for the voltage. And the voltage is actually where the damage is coming from. And the um, waveform most commonly used for voltage is somewhat quicker. 1.2 microseconds uh, for to reach the peak and uh, 10 microseconds. Uh, or 50 microseconds, depending on which model you use, uh, to reach 50% of peak. Um, you know, we throw these terms around, and in fact, this is the second time we've filmed it because I get them confused and probably will again. It reminds me of the blonde who came in to her boyfriend crying with the newspaper. Um, and he said, what's the problem? She said, well, it's right here in the paper. Three Brazilians were killed in a jet crash. He says, oh, my God, that's terrible. Uh, did you know him? She said, no, I don't even know how many is in a Brazilian. And so we throw around these terms, milliseconds, microseconds, nanoseconds, picoseconds, as if we know what we're talking about. I want to try to visualize some of that for you. We said we had an 8 by 20, 8 microsecond to peak and 20 microsecond to 50% of the peak value um, waveform description. If we compare 20 microseconds to a second, and you all have a pretty generic idea of how long a second is, um, and then we compare a second uh, to hours, and you have some sense of how long an hour is. Um, the ratio between 20 microseconds and one full second is the same as the ratio between the second and 13 hours, 53 minutes, and 20 seconds. A half a day. So that's what portion of a second, uh, 8 microseconds, 20, 20 microseconds is, 8 microseconds would be to 1 second as 1 second is to 34 hours, 43 minutes, and 20 seconds. And so that uh, kind of gives you a sense of the length of this. Um, the overwhelming um, choice for um, surge suppression is the metal oxide varistor. I'm going to put up a diagram here of a metal oxide varistor for you all to see, and we'll discuss it. It is a semiconductor device. Um, and it consists of a ceramic substrate, which is um, combined with zinc oxide granules, primarily a very small percentage of cobalt and manganese oxide crystals. And they're centered together under pressure and heat to form a semiconductor. And what they really are is a series of parallel diodes. A diode, as many of you know, will allow current conduction in one direction from the anode to the cathode, and it will block current going in the reverse direction uh, from the cathode to the anode. Um, most of the time, um, if you exceed the voltage rating of the diode, it will actually break down in the reverse direction because of a couple of effects. I'm not going to go into a lot, but that avalanche effect, electron tunneling, and thermionic emission, the PN junction breaks down 
and allows current to flow in what we would normally consider the reverse direction. Um, some gentlemen at Bell Labs uh, noted that they could control pretty well the voltage at which that reverse breakdown occurred and build the uh, semiconductors large enough such that they could recover from that. And they named it a Zener diode after um, Carl Melvin Zener, who had done some work for them uh, years before on the breakdown of insulators and had described the avalanche effect, electron tunneling, and so forth. And so we can use a Zener diode. We can manufacture them to precise voltages such as a 5 volt Zener, 6.3 volt Zener, 12 volt Zener and it will actually clamp the voltage at that. If you have a waveform that exceeds that it'll chop it off by going into conduction at that voltage. If you put those back to back you would have a, uh, a bipolar Zener device. Essentially a metal oxide varistor is uh, uh, a whole bunch of those in parallel, a larger device with lots of kind of large PN junctions in parallel. And they're formed between this uh, ceramic substrate and the zinc oxide granules. Um, and so we can build them where they can take quite a bit of current. Um, and for any voltage we want, by varying the uh, um, distance between the contacts and the density of the zinc oxide granules, we can have them um, trip at different um, voltages. And by that, I mean they are inert. They are blocking brick up to a certain voltage, at which point they start to leak current and then they will go into maximum conduction at what is referred to as the clamping voltage. Um, at one point they actually called them a voltage uh, dependent resistor and then they went to a zinc oxide uh, varistor and um, the, uh, finally because of the addition of magic sauce cobalt manganese in some cases they simply went to um, a me metallic oxide uh, varistor or MAV. They have a couple of interesting characteristics. We can vary the current they can pass by varying the diameter or the width of the device while its thickness and density of uh, PN junctions will determine the voltage. Um, but they have a couple of interesting uh, characteristics we want to keep in mind. Uh, they can do large currents repeatedly. Um, they are very, very fast in switching and um, unfortunately their failure mode is too short. And so this gives us some constraints in using them. Their actual uh, switching speed uh, would be on the order of 500 picoseconds intrinsically. Um, there are a thousand picoseconds in a nanosecond uh, or a nanosecond being a billionth of a second. Um, because the inductance of the leads to hook them up, you'll probably see switching uh, frequencies of uh, or, or periods more on the order of one nanosecond. Now we were talking about microseconds a minute ago. If you take a uh, nanosecond and compare that to a second and you compare the second uh, to a larger time frame, um, one nanosecond is to a second as one second is to 31 years, 251 days um, or 31 years, 8 months, 11 days, 7 hours. 46 minutes and 40 seconds. So pretty close to 32 years instead of the 34 hours where we were comparing the 8 nanoseconds. 
or the uh, yeah the eight nanoseconds to a second to compare one nanosecond to a second is the same as the second compared to almost 32 years. So it's a very small value and a very small fraction of the value of the eight microseconds. A microsecond being a thousand nanoseconds. And so that's a very interesting characteristic in that your MOV can switch uh, easily fast enough to catch even very small narrow pulse uh, transients. Lightning is, of course, the most common uh, cause. About 30% of our power failures are caused by lightning nationally, and uh, certainly many transients are. Uh, the way this happens, a direct lightning strike, of course, will cause one, but even a nearby strike uh, causes a huge pulse of electromagnetic um, electromagnetic field. And as we know, an expanding or contracting electromagnetic field across a conductor induces a current. A lightning strike can be as high as 200,000 amps of current from the sky to the ground or from a cloud to a cloud, but the sky to ground ones are mostly of concern uh, because if they're within a kilometer of a power line, it can induce a, uh, a current uh, resulting in a voltage spike and a current spike uh, of as much as um, 100,000 amps, uh, 50,000 amps, uh, very briefly, and voltages of 10 to 20,000 volts. Um, I'm going to put up here a diagram. This is going to be a more of concern to some of you than others. We live in southeast Missouri. This is a map of the Vizala National Lightning Detection Network. Um, cloud to ground lightning incidents in the continental United States from 1997 to 2011. And they actually, you may have seen this on the Weather Channel, they'll put up a map of lightning activity for that afternoon or something. That, this is where it comes from. They have sensors all over the country and they actually map lightning strikes. Southeast Missouri, where we're at, receives, um, oh, what am I seeing here? Probably 18 to 21 lightning strikes per square mile per year. That's not lightning strikes in the area. That's every square mile in this area gets um, 18 to 21 lightning strikes per year. When you look at California, all of the coast and most of California, they get between 0 and 0 0.25 lightning strikes um, per year. Means a square mile is likely to get a uh, lightning strike at most once every four years. Transient suppression isn't really a big deal for them. But uh, for us, uh, for all of Florida, coastal Texas, Louisiana, and Alabama, it's a pretty serious deal. And so we uh, need to uh, take care. We use kind of a tiered approach. UL 1449 describes three levels of protection. Uh, level one would be, be between your meter and your panel. Level two would typically be in your panel between the input switch and um, all your circuits. And level three is at the outlet. And that's uh, where you plug in. And it's uh, appropriate to use uh, a multi-tiered approach. We're gonna install in the panels, but that does not preclude us from using outlets. Uh, I've looked at a bunch of the outlets. Um, trip light is so head and shoulders above the rest. Um, they don't have a number two. It's like trip light and then number 17, 18, 19, and 20. There's no two through 16 really. Uh, so we use trip light surge protectors. Today we're looking at whole house surge protectors 
and uh, what that looks like. Um, again, they're almost entirely metal oxide varistor, but they have to be protected. Um, this is a first surge um, whole house from um, Siemens. We'll talk about that later. But they have um, metal oxide varistors with fuses in them. Midnight Solar used to have gone to a little bit different system, but a lot of metal oxide varistors have res um, um, fuses in them, thermal fuses. And if it shorts, the fuse opens. It makes it a little difficult to tell if the thing is still good, and a certain number of strikes is what it can absorb. And so um, uh, that's one way of protecting it, and that's what you'll have in most of your level threes. A lot of the whole house protectors do not have a fuse in them. And so to protect those, you plug them into a circuit breaker. Here's a square D circuit breaker. If I open this up and show it to you, it's actually a spring pawl assembly operated by the switch but it's tripped by a bimetallic strip. A bimetallic strip, typically steel and copper, uh, as it heats, um, one metal has a higher co coefficient of expansion than the other, and it causes it to bend. And if you get enough heat, it will trip that pawl, and the circuit breaker will trip off. So you use a couple of dedicated circuit breakers to um, act as the connection to your two phases uh, for your mobs, which are then connected to ground. There is uh, a number of strategies. Um, the preferred is a four-way. I confess I don't even understand it. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But that is to connect a mob between each phase and ground which does make sense to me, but then to connect one across the two phases. Well, they're both conductors, and if you hit a voltage transient, why would it hit one of them without the other one? They're both going to have the same pulse induced on them. Similarly, they um, like to tie uh, the neutral to ground and each of the phases to the neutral and each of the phases to the ground. Well, the neutral and the ground are separate in a box and right outside the box they're tied together to a ground pole. So I'm not sure I quite understand that. But certainly it's good medicine to connect each of the phases to ground and that's the, what we advocate doing and that's what Midnight Solar actually does this first surge has it every which way. The ground to the neutral, each phase to the neutral, each phase to ground. Uh, and uh, between uh, the two phases. So it's uh, a little bit of overkill in my estimation, but that's the, uh, the process. I want to take a look a little bit. I'm going to put it up on the screen here with a little fuse, metal oxide varistor, a spec sheet, and I've abbreviated it a lot to just the two we have here. This is the uh, V321BA60, and uh, this is the V271BA60. Um, and we'll go through this spec and discuss a few things. Um, let's take a look at the V271BA60. We've got some maximum ratings for continuous voltage and transient voltages, first thing. And our continuous voltage in VRMS, the V271, will allow continuous operation at 275 volts AC. Um, 369 volts DC. We'll get back to this, but 275 volts AC is a root mean square waveform description. The peak to peak on that is actually about 300 and 
83 volts and so that's why the difference between AC and DC um, the next column is kind of interesting it's the energy uh, that this can absorb uh, in these transients it's properly listed in watts and this one will uh, can dissipate 950 watts over a two millisecond which is 2,000 microseconds um, of uh, period. And under that, they have a J. This gets us into an area I really don't like, don't like to talk about. It's joules. It's uh, misapplied. And then it's multiplied by marketing people um, to try to cover a couple of uh, sins. And we'll talk about those in a minute. But it's 950 watts. A joule is a watt second, but it's not a watt to millisecond. <laughs> it's a watt second. Uh, that's why I take a kind of offensive term. But uh, watts can be instantaneous. It's simply a uh, product of voltage and current. And for two milliseconds, uh, this uh, 271 can uh, absorb 960 watts. Um, the peak current that it will pass safely and without damage is 50,000 amperes. And it'll do that for the 8 by 20 microsecond waveform, which I previously described. 8 microseconds from zero to peak and uh, 20 microseconds to decay from peak uh, down to 50% um, uh, value. At the 20 microseconds is actually from time zero, like the eight. So the whole waveform to 50% is 20 microseconds. And it takes eight microseconds that reach the peak and that describes a waveform curve. Varistor voltage at one milliamp. Uh, the metal oxide varistor begins to go into conduction at a voltage. And the current through it will increase as the voltage increases until you get to the clamping level. Beyond the clamping level, it will not increase the voltage uh, to destruction uh, at any current. And what they're describing here, a minimum, a nominal DC at a max is the voltage at which they reach one milliamp leakage current, which is a very small value. So it's kind of a large range. 387 volts is the minimum, 430 as the nominal, and 473 is the max. 387 is four volts above the 383 of the advised 275 volts continuous operation. And so, below 275 volts AC, or 369 volts DC, this is a brick. It doesn't do anything. And at slightly above that, it starts to conduct at about one milliamp. And then they will list a clamping voltage. Uh, by the time you reach 200 amps, the voltage will have risen to 680. And that's the clamping level. It's kind of short at that point. And from, from 200 amps to 50,000 amps, your voltage is not going to rise much above 680 volts. And so that's the Zener effect. We're chopping off the waveform at 680 volts to prevent damage to your device. The last column is the capacitance value that can apply in some RF circuits and so forth. In power circuits, it really doesn't matter. Now let's talk a little bit about this. Uh, we're gonna connect uh, one of these, actually the bigger one, the 321, between each phase and ground in our panel. Wait a minute, each phase compared to ground is typically 120 volts. Won't I get better protection if I had 
a working voltage just above 120 volts and a clamping voltage, say, um, about uh, 170 or 180 volts. Uh, well, yeah, you would, uh, up to a point. And people try to do this and size their mobs as close to their working voltage as possible. That, that, I think that's a mistake for three or four reasons. One, there are other types of voltage swells that are of longer duration. And voltage changes that may move you out of your uh, working voltage that you expect. Once it goes into conduction, um, metal oxide varistor is not designed for continuous operation and will quickly wear out and break down um, if it's uh, exposed to longer duration um, uh, swells or periods. Uh, that's the first reason. The second is that each time it uh, takes a strike, um, it deteriorates a little bit. And it exhibits that by lowering the voltage that you saw as V min, V nominal, and V max comes down a notch. And so after a number of strikes, you, you start to get down into your working voltage area, uh, that goes continuous and then your MOV is shorted. And so for lifetime purposes, um, I prefer a high, uh, a relatively high compared to what most people do, uh, gap between my working voltage and uh, my MOV 1 milliamp voltage. Um, Again, we're clamping at 680, and I said at the beginning, you know, there are some devices with 600 volt input caps could be damaged by such a spike, but of that brief a duration, I would think not. Um, and uh, most uh, consumer electronics are accustomed to a harsher environment than you might imagine. And as I said, minimally 1500 volt survival uh, many of them, uh, the better quality stuff, will go 2,000 or 2,500 volts. The problem is if you go 6,000 volts or 10,000 volts. And so we're going to clamp this, in this case, at 680. Um, actually, we're going to use the larger one. And it has a working voltage of 320 um, VAC 420 DC. Hmm, that's a handy number because our uh, batteries around here in cars uh, tend to be 400 volts. I might find a use for that there. 1100 watts and um, uh, 50,000 peak current is the same. We clamp at 760 uh, volts. Marketing speak. Let's talk just a little bit about jewels. If you hear the term jewel or you see it printed on a device, uh, try the best you can to ignore it while they keep pointing at it, wanting you to do this. Let me tell you where this comes from, I believe. We said that this uh, 321 here will uh, absorb 1100 watts, which they're kind of implying are joules here for two milliseconds. The UL1449 tests, when you claim 50,000 amps, they wanna see 50,000 amps at least 15 times. And so if you took 15 times, and you multiplied it by 1,100 watts, that would be 16,500 joules, theoretically, in this device. So I have a 16,500 joule life in this little fuse, massive kind of industrial um, device. 
But you know what? If I had two of them, I could tell you I had 33,000 jewels. Wouldn't that be cool? And which would sound better on the front of the box? 33,000 or 16,500? Let's go with 33,000. I mean, technically, they're in, they're in the box. You know, we, they're getting them. Uh, and so you see the games played. Yes, when you see a 3,000 jewel or a 4,000 jewel described as the biggest MF mob in the world, keep in mind that Jack has 33,000 jewels in his master panel. So 15 strikes absorbing up to 1,100 watts. I won't say it has no basis in fact at all, but it's uh, taking advantage of what you know and demonstrating what, uh, what you don't know and demonstrating what they don't know all in one fell swoop. It, it's not. And, and worse, they don't do it the same. Often they'll give it to you both in current and jewels in what is in each leg. And other manufacturers will combine the two. And in a case of four, I mean, they're in there. You might as well kind of multiply it by four and get an even bigger rating. And you see how this goes. So the, the area is fraught with uh, a kind of nonsense. Let's take a break and we'll come back and talk about some of these individual devices. Let's do that. Let me sit down for a second. Smoke a cigarette. Take five. Smoke if you got Okay, them. before we get to some specific devices, I wanted to talk a little bit about the dandy job uh, James and uh, Danu did in installing my little fuse um, varistors. Unfortunately, these are kind of American-made heavy block resistors for industrial applications. And they're 145 bucks a piece. That means uh, 290 uh, in my panel. And so you'll see why this is not a popular choice. Um, but it does provide good protection. Uh, 50,000 amps per leg. I guess that's 100,000 amps. Um, and 1,100 watts times 15. I guess that's 16,500 joules. No weight is 33,000 joules. And anyway, the criteria is we've got the ground bar. I want to be careful pointing. I'll use my Dr. Pepper can. Uh, the panel's live right now. But the ground bar goes down the left side. We have two um, blocks here. And they each have two terminals. It's real simple. One goes into a 20 amp uh, square D um, circuit breaker and one goes to ground. If the mob fails, how can I tell? The circuit breaker pops. If I set it back on again and it pops again, I, I guess we're pretty much done with that mob. So I don't need any audible alarms, LEDs, or any of that. Uh, I can check it periodically. But they should last uh, for quite a while because they're just massively big. Note the um, um, length of the leads. We've got, I would say, three to four inches, uh, both to the circuit breakers and to the ground thing. And that is to keep that activation speed down under one nanosecond. And again, What's that in people speak? I think it was about 34 years uh, compared to a second. Um, and it's certainly below um, the period even of 1.2 uh, microseconds by uh, three orders of magnitude uh, of a voltage spike. So that's a critical function. We sell not at any profit really a little bit but uh, as a convenience to our uh, uh, viewers the midnight solar 
surge protection device, the MNSPD-300-AC, which you can use for AC or DC, up to a point. This is kind of interesting. And one of the reasons we started carrying them was because you could get them. They were difficult to find. They have sold a lot of these, and as a result, having such success, they've completely redesigned it. And I have a spec sheet on it, but I didn't get it from Midnight Solar. And I'm not sure why, but if they still have the links on their website for spec sheets for all of their um, surge protection devices, and those links don't lead to anything. I don't have any spec sheets for these anymore. Uh, interestingly, they uh, claim 80,000 amperes uh, for two MOSFETs, I mean two uh, metal oxide baristers. There used to be eight in here, and they listed it as 57,000 amps. Again, people just get carried away with the claims, um, multiplying things, I guess because it's in the box. But I found this very interesting, an 80,000 amp claim. They also used some new uh, varistors. And that is a Sincera, um, and it's a T34RB RCN 331K. And by the way, there is no such thing. Doesn't exist in the world. In fact, Sincera doesn't really exist anymore. And I've been trying to track these down. So there is no spec sheet on it per se. It turns out Sincera was bought by a, a Taiwan company. And I think they were a Taiwan company. Not Chinese, but sort of Chinese. They're in Taiwan. Called the Walson, Walson Technology Corporation. And Walson is in, own, in turn apparently owned by a conglomerate called the Passive System Alliance that specializes in passive components, which they consider the metal oxide varistor a passive component. Uh, I don't know if they actually consider it that. It's part of their line, and they're most famous for their capacitors, which are capacitive components. Um, they do have an interesting device called the SR331K34RD. And it is a 34 millimeter uh, die uh, MOV. But it's kind of interesting. Uh, it has three legs. Now you often see three legs on a uh, metal oxide barrister. The little fuse has a thing called IT mob. And what it is is a uh, fuse and a metal oxide barrister and a third lead between the fuse and the metal oxide barrister, which you can tap off of to see if there's any voltage after the fuse and the mob is going to be good until it isn't at which point the fuse will blow and so you won't have any voltage there and you use an LED and I believe this is what Midnight Solar did. Now they have a new design. They still have two LEDs but they have these two three-legged uh, 34 um, millimeter mobs and what looks like some little metal fusing uh, to each of them raised off the circuit board. And I'm going to assume that's what that is, is a fuse. And what they're really using is maybe a customized version of this SR331K34RD. And what that is, is two metal oxide varistors in here back to back and so you can access one between pins one and two, another one between pins two and three, or you can access them in parallel from one to three. That's kind of cunning because we could take the 
pin to um, junction point and run that to ground and take one and three and run that to each of the phases and you'd have a complete solution with a 40,000 amp capability um, in one, one chip for a, a whole house device. And I'm going to try to track some of these down um, and get them to put in the store. Uh, so you could do just that. It would be a pretty cunning device all by itself. You still need fusing. And they have some kind of dubious looking fusing here. Um, but I'm sure it's effective. And they've somehow worked out how to detect shorts or something with uh, what looks like two MOSFETs and a bunch of little components uh, that in here with two LEDs. But they're claiming on this device um, nominal voltage 0 to 300 volts DC, a um, clamp voltage 470 volts, uh, UL 1449 fourth edition type 1 and that's what makes me believe there's fusing in here because you have to have fusing to be between the meter and the, the circuit breaker panel because you don't have a circuit breaker to use it with I we still use these mostly at the panel and that's fine but they're talking about an 80,000 amp capability uh, they're individually fused and um, 12 aug uh, wiring and blue uh, LEDs. And so I think this is a redesigned device. Um, I'm not sure what's going on with the spec sheets, but I suspect this is the Walson. Um, SR331K34RD um, device and it's actually a dual MOV and they're using pins 1 and 3 um, although they've got all three connected here somehow um, maybe they're using uh, two of them in parallel as I stated ground to uh, pin 2 and um, uh, pins one to one uh, phase and and three to the other and there's two of them in parallel and that would all work and would be 80,000 amps so this continues to be our favorite package reasonably priced they're about 120 bucks something like that um, which is less than one of these uh, imagine my surprise then when at great difficulty we took apart this, about a $240 device from Siemens called First Surge. They have them at three levels, 100, um, uh, 60,000 amp, 100,000 amp, 140,000 amp for the pro version. And we open that up and it's got the everything connected to everything um, version which you might like. That's uh, L1 to L2, L1 to neutral, L2 to neutral, L1 to ground, L2 to ground, and ground to neutral. Uh, would you believe they're also marked Sincera? Google Sincera, there's nothing on them. There's no spec sheet, they're not available anywhere, not mouse or not DigiKey. Again, it tracks back to Walson. And that looks like there, um, it's called, it's labeled T25DBN241K, but appears to be similar to the Walson SR241K25D. That's a 25 um, millimeter diameter of metal oxide varistor. 150 volts AC, 240 volts DC, and 18,000 amps each. Well, if you take four of them, that's 72,000. And I guess if you took two of the legs and counted that, that would be 144,000. And you could call that 140,000 and somehow sleep at night. 
uh, okay. Uh, so if you only had three, I guess it would be, uh, you know, uh, 50 something thousand um, times two is a hundred. And if you had two of them, I guess you got 36,000 times two, you could call it a 60. Um, I think that's what's going on here. In any event, this one is kind of uh, sturdy, nice enclosure, uh, very well put together. We had a lot of difficulty getting it apart. It is everything to everything, and it has both audible alarms and LEDs for everything. Uh, it's kind of pricey, about 240 bucks. I think we got this on Amazon from somebody at 217 but it shows up at 240 a lot. But it's a whole house device, audible alarms, LED alarms, and it's essentially surging everything to everything. Uh, it's a good unit, no doubt about it. Um, we've got an Eaton CHSPT2 Ultra. 22,000 amps. Uh, it's a nicely designed unit. Um, it uh, does both legs, red and black, to both neutral and ground. And so I think that's a pretty nice device. Uh, the rest of it looks uh, dubious to me um, for the panel level stuff. Uh, and I guess we would recommend the Midnight Solar, both on price and capability. And uh, for my uses, if you want to play uh, big boy stuff, I still like Little Fuse's Industrial Series. Um, we'll probably mark them up a little bit and put them in the store. I got the last eight um, 321s in existence, I think. Mouser wants 16 weeks lead time to get them. Um, the 271s are a little more available and would work just as well. Uh, again, my philosophy is to have a kind of a big gap between your working voltage and your uh, one milliamp voltage and clamp voltage. Uh, most people advocate having it closer but I've read a couple of papers that uh, sort of put me in the camp of uh, higher gap of voltage uh, because um, our mission here is really to keep it under 1500 volts and 680 or 720 is fine and I'll get longer life out of these expensive devices um, by having them at a higher uh, voltage level. Um, and again, as far as jewels, uh, I guess I got 33,000 or so, maybe. I don't know. Um, lots of them. Uh, and uh, again, I'm a little dubious about that. So that's kind of a roundup of devices uh, on balance. You know, I don't know a lot about Sincera or Walson. Um, but um, these appear to be newer devices and probably uh, some advance. I like this three-legged pin. What it means, I'll try to get some of these that you could use one of these and get uh, uh, 40,000 amps a leg. Um, at nowhere do they give you the uh, energy absorption and they're just not big enough a device to be able to do what these can do. But, um, you know, this may be a fairly recent chip. It is a Midnight Solar redesign of their device. And I think they're selling a ship pot full of these already is what's led to that. So I'm going to assume they get this chip cheaper and it does more uh, than the eight chips they had in there. Uh, trying to do 57,000 amps before. And now they're claiming 80,000 amps with two... Uh, mobs and uh, but built in fusing and uh, and uh, frankly me I I think L1 to ground L2 to ground that's the trick um, 
everything else between everything else well they uh, there are uh, serious people in the industry that think that's the way to do it and it is described in UL 1449 as one of the configurations um, with the implication that that would be better um, I'm not sure I see how but um, I suppose you can't have too much uh, um, surge suppression in any event I don't want to use the thing of scaring you I think your TV and your computers and all of that work just fine and will under significant surges uh, but in what we're doing here um, with the Signier inverter and batteries and so forth uh, I really don't want any surges in that cabinet at all and so we've got a midnight solar fore and aft uh, coming into the uh, uh, grid input and on our output and then we run that into a panel with two of these uh, devices and so we're going to clean up the power around here but part of that's where we're at again we uh we take 18 to 21 lightning strikes per year per square mile well a lightning strike in the center of a square mile is within a half mile of every line that's in it and that winds up being a big surge we do have power outages almost all of them are a function of lightning. Uh, it's 30% nationwide. I bet it's 90 here. Uh, that's that's mostly why we go down in this area is lightning strikes. And uh, I have lost equipment um, from those. A uh, couple of uh, really the surge protectors, a battery backup surge protection device, I've had to replace a couple of times at home uh, because of. Uh, power outages and I assume lightning strikes as part of that so we're going to clean up the power around here and spend the money on this stuff um, you let your conscience be your guide but I wanted to clear up what you're doing why you're doing that and uh, the state of the art uh, in the newest um, really pretty much whole house master panel type 2 devices uh, this is a claim type 1. We use it as a type 2, and that's perfectly fine. Um, and so uh, that's the story uh, on uh, surge protection and the nature of um, um, voltage and current spikes uh, that can be damaging to devices in your home power system. Um, to some degree, if you live in an apartment in a city and you got good grid power, that's uh, that's all on uh, somebody else. If you're building uh, solar energy storage devices, putting in inverters, and doing your own wiring in your house, um, it's a big investment, and I would urge you to uh, clean up the power and protect yourself. Uh, from weather events. Stay with us.